we're in um, in the middle of a, of of really I think what has to be probably the most controversial, most powerful, uh, the most revealing uh, prophecies in the Bible. I mean, I, I would I would dare someone. I mean, where is there one more fascinating? <laughs> where is there one more interesting? Um, <clears throat> And where is there one where basically there's not a single verse that's not controversial? There's not there's not a single verse in this in this passage that isn't where, where you know there, obviously you can find 20 different opinions. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, in my very fast overview that we did last week. I, I hope that I did not come off as being dogmatic about one particular view. However, because there's just so much to unpack. In this, in this section, I, I thought it would be good to just have one more class on Daniel chapter 9 <clears throat> to, and I have some questions for you, and I hope you have some questions for me, and I hope we can at least leave this section feeling good about it. Um, and if you don't feel good about it, please don't, you're not alone, so just let, let me know what we could do. Uh, to clarify some points and, 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 and at least give some clarity because, you know, this is just, you know, it's a really important piece that, <clears throat> that uh, has so much that hangs in the balance as far as this, prophet, this prophetic uh, utterance coming to, coming, to, coming to pass. So, um, <clears throat> let's, let's go to God in prayer and let's, uh, let's begin. Our dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just ask for understanding. Dear Father, we ask for wisdom. Uh, when we come to passages like this that, that, that confound many, we just pray for wisdom. And, and dear Father, we may not have all the answers, but we, we know that, that you are the fulfillment of this prophecy. And you are the one that takes away the sins of the world. You are the anointed one. You are the king of kings. And, and dear Father, we just recognize you as the great and almighty God. And we humbly bow before you. We ask uh, that you fill us with your spirit. Help us to understand and have wisdom um, so that we can be prepared in the, in the days that come for your second coming. Dear Father, we, just, we, we, we know that, <clears throat> that there are so many that are lost and so many that aren't prepared. And we pray, dear Father, that we can have an influence on them, that we can have the wisdom and the instruction to be able to give to them to, to, be, be, to be one of your saved people. And dear Father, thank you for salvation that, that comes through your son Jesus. Thank you for the blood that was shed. And, and dear Father, thank you for... Um, being that last and final sacrifice for us. Uh, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, question for you. So we're gonna, let's, let's, let's together turn to um, a really easy section of, of, of Scripture to, to understand. That's Matthew 24. Uh, <clears throat> going from one, uh, that, was a, that was a joke, by the way. This is not an easy piece of Scripture. Uh, Matthew 24. But I, th I think it's, uh, we, we, are, we are not going to spend the entire class on 24, but I have a question for you that dawned on me, and I'm going to see if it dawns on you. Um, <clears throat> of course, the, the context here is, is that we, we have what appears to be a couple of questions being asked Jesus. And what are those questions that are being asked of Jesus here? <clears throat> Okay, so Jesus is pointing out the buildings of the temple, and uh, so so and he's going to make a statement that you know there's going to be a point where not one stone is left on the other, and and the disciples are going to ask in essence you know when is that going to happen, and then when is the when are the when is the sign of your coming uh, in essence going to you know going to be or when's the sign of the, se the, the second coming, so there's a couple of questions that are that are in there and Jesus is going to you know answer those questions. And where you want to cut off where he begins one answer or the other question, we're not going to go there tonight. But, but let's, let's get down to this, this section in verse 15 because there's going to be language here that you should, that you should find uh, similar to that, what we've seen in Daniel. So someone read verses <clears throat> um, 15 through uh, 20. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get things out of his house. 
And whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those women who are pregnant, who are pregnant, and those who are nursing babies in those days. Moreover, pray that when you flee, it will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. And someone read 21 and 22, please. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world, until this time. No, not ever shall be, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Okay. So first of all, Jesus is, <clears throat> is standing, and, you know, l let's just say that, you know, what... what Someone toss out a date. Do you think we're at here? Again, guess, but you know we're, we're not we're not close. We're not far away from his crucifixion. So let's just say maybe twenty nine, maybe even thirty, right? And Jesus is referring in verse fifteen. He says, "So when you see the abomination of desolation, by the way, did, do you guys remember that a reference to abomination of desolation in Daniel? And in that context." What was the event that was the abomination of desolation that we've, we've talked about that happens? Oh, it's going to happen. Uh, that's happened in the past and at this point. Uh, but Jesus is obviously referring to another abomination of desolation. But what was the one that Daniel was prophesying uh, in, uh, in, in chapter 8? Yes. So it's, it's going to be the uh, Antiochus Epiphanes um, going into the temple, uh, you know, sacrificing a pig at the temple. He's going to basically, um, you know, do what would be unspeakable, an unspeakable crime that would be an ab abomination. Uh, and uh, and so, so we, we have that reference. So Jesus is not referring to that past event. He's referring to a future event. And then this future event, he says, is spoken of, or that's referred to by... Daniel. So what is Jesus saying here in this one little short passage? And what can we infer from this? That there's this event. It's connected to Daniel. And, and then at the very, in the, the third word, or there's the very first phrase, he says, so when you see it. Yes, that's the first point that I think we need to take away from this and that this isn't some future tribulation that's going to happen after or in some time in the future that, that would be a part of this premillennial concept. And, and I wanted you to read verse 21 because, you know, there are many people who put this quote unquote tribulation period as a period in the future that's going to be over the course of the seven weeks. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> how many of you have heard the seven years of tribulation? Where's the only place in the entire Bible where you get the equivalent of seven years, and that'd be seven weeks? The only place you'll find that. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 9. So where do premillennialists get a seven-year tribulation? Daniel chapter 9. It's the only place that you'll find it only place. You ask someone where that comes from, they'll tell you Daniel chapter 9. So, you know, how could it be a future event when Jesus says himself, you're, you're going to see it? I don't know. And then when you ask them, of course, you know, they believe that, that before this event, there's going to be a rapture. So before the seven years tribulation, there's going to be a rapture where Jesus is going to come secretly and rapture the church away so that some don't have to go through that tribulation period. And then after the seven years tribulation, Jesus will come down to earth, reign on a literal throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. The basis of all that is, in essence, in part from Daniel. So what's another thing that... that now, and I'll, I'll give you a hint. We, we discussed last time, you know, why is it or how can we make a connection to the... The, 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 the weeks that are referred to in Daniel chapter 9 and connect them to years. We talked about a, a passage in Ezekiel that referred to, you know, you know one year, uh, one week being one year in prophetic, in prophetic utterances. You have the Hebrew that says that kind of conveys a seven, it's like, it's like 70 weeks of years 
in essence. That's kind of a, at least a, a loose translation. But what's another way that we can legitimately, without making too big of a leap, connect those weeks in Daniel chapter 9 to years? Based upon what we just read. <clears throat> So we, we've talked about the fact that we have these three periods. The first period being seven weeks, second period being 62 weeks, and then the last period being one week. You translate those into years, you get 490 years, which equates to 70 weeks. Okay? So <clears throat> we have these three epochs, these three periods of time. You know, the one, the, 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 the seven weeks that translates into 49 years, the second week's 483 years, or the, the combined first two, 483, and then the last week, you know, brings us to 490. How do we make that leap? How do we, what's, what's a justification for saying that those, in fact, should be interpreted as years instead of weeks, months, or whatever? You said they ain't happened yet, there's gonna be more than weeks. Well, okay, so Matthew, you're right on. So Jesus himself is connecting a future event to Daniel. And you can't do that unless those weeks become years. Does everyone follow that? How could they be months? How could they be real weeks? Because he's referring to Daniel as to an event that's about ready to happen. Does it, so my only point here is that our connection to those weeks in Daniel chapter 9 being actual years is not based upon flimsy, you know, kind of bad hermeneutics. Most everyone, and, and this, is not the, the, this is not the measuring stick upon which we base our uh, hermeneutics, but you know, conservative, liberal, almost everyone connects those weeks of Daniel chapter 90 years, and I think that this justifies that. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Michael, does that make sense to you? Okay. Is, that all makes sense, but we're connecting what Jesus says the abomination of desolation to something that we just said it wasn't. Okay, well, the abomination of desolation in this case is, is going to be connected to Rome. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, that, that causes some, it could be it causes some confusion. I mean, Daniel clearly references the abomination of desolation. Jesus says this is an abomination of desolation like you read in Daniel. Daniel? Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> and yet we're saying they're different things. That, that gets somewhat convoluted. It, it gets tough, yeah. Um, and, and most certainly we know that there's been in history and, and, and there probably will be in history multiple des, you know, abominations of desolation. Um, you know, and, and we, you know, in chapter 8 he gets really into specifics that this is, you know, that there's going to be, I mean, Th that this was connected, yeah, that this is going to be connected to, um, and in chapter 11, that this is going to be connected to Antiochus, you know, some yeah, events that take place. That. I can see where somebody <clears throat> right. find that confusing. So, in that respect, the, the destruction of Jerusalem, where by all accounts we have, you know, an image of in Daniel chapter 9, we're going to go back there in a second, so we have a picture of, of a destruction of, of, a, of a similar you know, abomination of desolation that happened uh, in the interbiblical period. So if our 490 years, let's just say that we're, we're staying with the 490 years, in that last seven years, remember we said in the midst of the seven years there was going to be something, and, and what is, what is uh, if, you, if you just, let's skip back over to Daniel chapter 9 and look at verse 27. And remind me what's going to happen in the midst of that last seven years. <clears throat> yeah, the end of sacrifice. Um, so we, we have a, a specific reference to, in essence, the, the, the veil of the curtain being torn, the death of Jesus. And there's not a whole lot of debate that exists that that's in fact the death of Jesus, that the crucifixion of Jesus. So if that happens in the, you know, let's just say his anointment was in 27, his death is in, in 30, well, we have another three and a half years. And, and scripture indicates that there's going to be, um, again, looking down at Daniel chapter 9, let's follow together. 
And it says, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And so over the course of that seven years, there's going to be the establishment of a covenant. And of course, again, that's not hard for us because Jesus is going to institute a new covenant that was prophesied, you know, who, who prophesied about this new covenant and gave us a great amount of detail about that? Jeremiah himself, who Daniel is quite familiar with, right? What's, what's Daniel reading at the beginning of chapter 9? He's reading Jeremiah. Did, did Daniel read his, was it chapter 36 where he talks about the new covenant? Probably. <laughs> uh, you know, how much did Daniel understand that there was going to be a new covenant? I don't know. But we have a picture here, and he's prophesying himself about the establishment of a covenant. So my point that I'm, that I'm, I'm taking this is that that doesn't take us to 70. So the, the destruction of Jerusalem is not part of, again, if we're even remotely within this, you know, in this right framework, uh, we're not, so the destruction of Jerusalem is not part of the 490 years, but happens after those events, um, which is okay. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't disrupt the, prof, the prophecy. It is something that he's prophesying that's going to happen, but it's not going to be part of that 490 years. Yes, sir? I think it's clear that it's not part of the 490 years, because in the end of verse 27, it says, and on the wings of abominations shall come the one who makes desolation. Okay, yeah, Matt. I, I think you're right. I think that that's, I think you're right on there. And on the wings of abominations shall come one who makes desolate um, until the decree is in and poured out on the desolator. We have this word desolate and desolator. Um, he's going to make desolate. What is going to be made desolate? And why is he using that term? What's he prophesying that's going to become desolate? And, and just, can someone define that for us? I mean, what, would be the, what would be just a general definition? This might be not right on. <laughs> that's OK. When you talked about possible anointing being the triumphal entry, just the desolation of the temple, like just okay. the, the disappointment, not maybe but well, I can't help but think that that also plays a part in all of this right. because of that and how we, you kind of talked about, um, you know, they, they could have known that, that he okay. was coming and that he yeah, was yeah. and all this stuff and, and what happened like after that. Right. The verses we read before. Um, I don't think you're off. The temple yeah. is now going to be, uh, you know what I mean? Like he cleansed the temple. Mm -hmm. like, well, I think you're on the right t track, and, and so, you know, when, when he talks about, just, just to reemphasize a point, if we go back to, again, the 70 weeks, starting in verse 24, and it says, 70 weeks shall decree about your people, the holy city, to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin. So we have this list of things, um, and, and, and among those things, and to anoint a, mo a most holy place. Now, that word, does anyone have a different translation than place? That's not a good translation. Okay, it's the better translation is Holy One. <laughs> so we've already had a class on who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? He is in essence. So after the after Babylon, after the exile, does Jesus does God ever fill that temple with His presence? No, He does not. They were looking for that, but one would come who would be the temple. And, and in essence, would, would become the temple. So, so Jesus himself is the one that's being referred to as the Holy One who's going to be anointed. And, and I think the best place for that anointment to have taken place is his baptism. However, that passage that we read about in Luke chapter 19 um, probably, wouldn't, couldn't be, probably wouldn't be referring to an anointment, but it, it certainly would have been Jesus potentially referring to the fact that you know, if you wouldn't have killed the, the prophets, and if you would have listened, you would have been prepared for this day. You, you, did, you weren't looking for this day. So you were right on there. But, and, then, and then 
regarding desolation, when you think the desolation of, I mean, you're, you're looking at something that becomes not only vacant, but almost a vacuum of, ne of, of you know, it's come as a negative space. Something that is, that's been, you know, irrevocably, you know, uh, all life has been pulled out. Did, would anybody have a different <laughs> way of putting that? Abandoned. Say again? Abandoned. Abandoned. Completely left. Yeah. So that place serving maybe no purpose anymore, you know, something that's desolate. Well, how, how better of a way would you describe the temple? the physical temple itself. And, and I think that this word desolate that we're talking about is, is, is describing what would become of the temple um, because it's just a physical building. They're going to kill the Holy One that was the temple. And, and within the temple itself, number one, there would be no purpose. What was the purpose of the temple? It was the, the purpose of it was to you know, become united with Yahweh through those sacrifices. The purpose was the, was to, was the Day of Atonement. Uh, the Day of Atonement would be the, 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 the one day of the year that, the, that the, the chief priest would go into the Holy of Holies. This place would, not, would become not only desolate and empty, it would serve no more any purpose. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any thoughts? Um, and thank goodness Thank, thank God that we don't, have, we don't have to put our hope in a building and that we're not clamoring to the Western Wall like we saw and where these people are fervently looking for God in a broken down building with a mosque sitting right on top of it. Aren't you grateful that we have our hope and that our hope is really built on the temple that was Jesus, the one that was anointed. And when, when, when Daniel says here that, uh, and to anoint a most holy place, sc scratch out place, that's holy one. Um, because that's, that's the better description. So, so these references to desolation, again, think of the temple and just not only, of course, is it in ruin, um, not only, of course, is it gone now, it's going to be gone, you know, permanently in AD 70. It says, know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem. We talked about this. Now, I, 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 just a little bit of, just one more point on this reference that we have here. Um, and, I, and, I, and this is a, something that we didn't quite go through. I, I showed you a slide and... <laughs> Never have the slide ready, but I'm going to go to this. I'm going to see if I can get to the slide that has the list of those years. Okay, all right. I'll I'll just well let's go back there. See if we can if I can keep it there. No, nope. hold on. Okay, boy, I'm I'm sorry, guys. These things have a mind of their own. We gave up. We we showed you some dates. Of of various you know various times, we we talked about 538. Okay, now when when is Daniel giving this prophecy? I think that we're in this realm, 538ish. Um, and so, how many of you would be able to kind of tell me where the 70 years of captivity began and ended? That's a hard one because Nebuchadnezzar is going to come upon Jerusalem how many times? First one's going to be 606. Second one's going to be, you know, uh, you know, again, I think yeah, 597 and then 586 is the final. So if you, if we, we know 538, we know 536, Cyrus is going to give that decree. You go back to 536 backwards, where do you land? Yeah, 606. You, you land at 606, which is the first of those, you know, of those deportations, in fact, that would be when Daniel himself is likely taken into captivity. So the captivity, if you were to kind of put 70 years, would probably start upon the first arrival of Nebuchadnezzar in about 606. And so you have 606, 636, you're at 70 years. So uh, I, I shared with you my opinion that, that, that I have always felt as though 
if, if I were to put my finger upon the word to restore and build Jerusalem, that I would put that at 536 in this, in this same period of time. Uh, here's what some people would say to that. In that passage that where Cyrus is giving that decree, there'd be some that say that his emphasis is not on rebuilding Jerusalem, but rebuilding what? The temple. And so some would say, oh, it's not 536. Um, it's, it's because he's, he's, his emphasis is on rebuilding the temple. When you get to 457, you find the command to, again, rebuild. And, and what's confusing is, is that this is Darius now, but Darius is basically kind of, what is he, what's he doing? He's restating Cyrus's decree again. And later on, when Artaxerxes, and again, you know, I believe Darius and Artaxerxes are likely the same with the one person. When he gives the decree, um, it, it, it's again, it's the decree of Darius, or it's the decree of Cyrus. So, but the only place where the math makes the most sense is the 457, 457 date. Now, in, in doing a little bit more digging, remember I showed you another date, and I think that this, we discussed this date, and it was the 440, what, where am I at? I picked the wrong, hold on, I got the wrong presentation up. So the, uh, we, we picked, remember we talked about the 444 date? Okay, oh, apologies guys, let me pull up the right one, there it is. <clears throat> okay, let me just go to the slide here. Uh, we talked about the 444 date. What, what I, what's interesting is, is that the, the 444 date is the, the date that is, the, that, that is primarily the date that's chosen by the premillennialist. Pre um, and, and, and the reason why is because um, all that they really care about is that last seven years. <laughs> And so what they do, um, and but so these are the dates here. Um, <clears throat> Seventh Day Adventists uh, are, uh, and and also the Watchtower Association. Watchtower Association has some really peculiar views on this particular point. But the uh, the four four the four forty four date, if you do the math there, it, it puts you way past Jesus. Um, and what they would say is is that that what, what's most important is that last seven years, which God has in essence put in his back pocket to fulfill later. So the premillennialists would say, well, that last week has not been fulfilled and that's going to come um, and that's gonna be part of that tribulation that's going to happen. But before that happens, there's gonna be a rapture. Um, and um, the... Uh, I'll tell you what's really interesting. The, there, does anyone know the proof text for the rapture, by the way? <clears throat> and I, I, did, I, I, did, I was not prepared for this, but I want us to look at that passage. It's, it's in First or Second Thessalonians. We're the called up in the... So help me here find, get to that passage. I, I want to point out just at least one point. <clears throat> Is it Second Thessalonians? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay, let's look at this. <clears throat> so this idea of being caught up together is the entire basis of the rapture. Now, does, I don't know how many, maybe some of you, maybe some of you are from the denominational, have, have a denominational background, but who can tell me about what is said to happen with this rapture according to the premillennialist millennialist? Anybody know some details about it? A secret. Tape right, of right, science. right. Uh, there's going to be people who are just, you know, driving down the road and all of a sudden their cars are going to just, you know, cars are going to all of a sudden be empty. Um, there's been lots of good movies, some fanciful ideas on this. But it's going to be something that's quiet, secret, something that's uh, mysterious, maybe something that, that only a handful will 
will be able to, to comprehend or, or, or notice. Now, let's see if that concept is consistent with this passage. And let's, let's follow here. So <clears throat> Paul here says, but we do not want you to be inf uh, misinformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you uh, by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Follow this. For the Lord himself will descend with heaven with a what? Okay, that's a lot of noise for uh, a secret event. But it gets better. <clears throat> so with a shout, uh, and then um, and with the voice of the archangel, and then there's going to be what? The sound of the trumpet of God. This is the loudest rapture uh, that you, I, I mean, well, this is the loudest secret event that I think you'll ever find. Folks, the, the idea of there being some secret, mysterious taking away of the church is nothing but fantasy. And it, it sounds great, and it sounds like one of those Gnosticism, it sounds like Gnosticism, really, where you kind of have to have the secret code, you have to have the secret knowledge which will enlighten you and somehow, um, you know, give you an advantage over someone who doesn't have that secret knowledge and, and those types of things. But it just doesn't make sense. But it's important to know that the basis of this seven-year tribulation, of course, begins in Daniel chapter 9. <clears throat> okay. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 9. Let's just hit a, hit a few other points. So um, how many, so ha, tell me who has, who has a question or, or comment or thought at this point? Well, they believe that we're outside of that. They believe that we're well outside of the prophecy of, 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 uh, of Daniel, with the exception of that one period. Everything else has happened. And that we are in a, a pre-tribulation time. We're in a time where there's going to be wars and rumors of war and those types of things. So they would say that we're in that era that's pre-trib. Like we're just waiting. Yes. Yeah. And all of, the, all of the events that are taking place around the world, the, you know, the, the, those are all signs of, of, of impending tribulation. And that's why everyone's looking for an escape from the tribulation through the rapture. Now, as some of you know, not every premillennialist believes in a rapture. There's non-rapturist and there's rapturist. There's pre-tribulation and post-tribulation premillennialists. But what can be said is that in general across the board, that premillennialists believe that, that the church, God's, you know, God's kingdom that he established was put in place as really a stopgap uh, for a, a, a true and material kingdom that he's going to set up here on earth. Um, and of course, what's fairly consistent across the board is that there is a literal reigning on earth of Jesus from a throne in Jerusalem. Where does all that come from? It comes from gross misinterpretation of the book of Revelation. Um, and, and, and here's the thing. You know, you, the, the, the key is, and, and, it, and it's going to seem as though we're not being consistent with that, you know, kind of putting literal 490 years here. But, but when you, you know, if... If, if Daniel chapter 9 had, there's going to be a thousand years, um, or, there, or there's going to be 144,000 of this or that, um, you know, th th those are, you know, th those are clearly, uh, you know, symbolic numbers. The, the number seven is a symbolic number. The number six is a symbolic. What, what is symbolic about six? That's exactly right. It's, it's short of sevens. It's short of perfection. That's why you do six times three, you get six, six, six. That's the sign of the beast. So that's someone who's, who way, that falls way short of perfection. Um, you know, a thousand years being really a, a time period of which, you know, God has chosen to be, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a God-ordained period of time. It's not a specific period of time. 
if it weren't for the fact that we have such specificity regarding Jesus here, and if it weren't for the fact that Jesus himself connects Daniel to his own time period, I, I would generally be more inclined to take these numbers as symbolic. Do you follow me? <laughs> because again, apocalyptic language in general, unless otherwise indicated, which I think this is maybe an exception, you have to look at the numbers and have to look at things in a way that's symbolic. It, I know it seems like we're maybe being hypocritical in, this, in that regard, but I think that this passage is one with such specificity that it almost, it, it really, there's just no other way to, to, to connect Daniel to, uh, to, the, to the times of Jesus unless you have those years in place. Agree, disagree, points, it's okay to disagree. So this comes back to a question or an issue that we talked about last time. And uh, I know you have a solution, I just have to put the pieces together. Sure. Here. If, if we agree that 536 is the most logical starting place and we agree that the 490 years or years, we, we don't get to Jesus. Right. So we've got we to square that circle. Right, right. And the way, the way that, that I would square that is that Ptolemy, a Greek pagan, uh, artificially lengthened the Persian uh, king, uh, king list. Uh, and there are more than a number of scholars that believe that it's about 80 years too long. So if you go 536, add about 80, you get right where you should get if you add 490 years. So add about 80, get you to 450 neighborhood. 456, so, 455, so somewhere like that. Well, I, so the 70 years, uh, I, I think that the difference is Babylonian chronology versus Persian chronology. Okay. Um, I mean, the seven, 70 years captivity. Okay. So yeah, so the 70 years is directly related to a number 490. I mean, there were, there were 490 years where they did not, on the seventh year, rest the land. Now, if you do that math, what's very interesting is that when you, if you're trying to calculate how, the, how God came up with 70 years, the, it, the numbers don't quite work out unless you add the Jubilee years. <laughs> so remember that the land was to be rested every seventh year, but also every 49th year, every, every Jubilee. So when you add all of those up, you get 70. So, um, you know, is it coincidence that 490 years is the number that Jesus is doing the math with, or the number God's doing the math with to get 70 years of captivity? Is it by coincidence that we are looking at almost, well, we're looking at 490 years to Jesus? So your contention would be, sorry, your contention would be if we, if we truly had God's divine timeline laid out and secular history was stripped from our minds that we would see that the return to Cyrus's decree was really in 450 BC as we, as we define BC. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that well, I, I think that's a theory. It's a hypothesis. And that, but that gets 490, gets us. It gets us right to Jesus. Yes, it does. Now, I, I, I do not want to in any way say, shape, form. No, just, and I'm, I'm not saying that I, I could be wrong there. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is that if you hold to the 457 or any date later, you are looking at a really inconsistent pattern in which God works. Not only that, but you get a Ezra and you get a Nehemiah that are literally in their 130s at the end of their books. So you have major problems sticking with the accepted chronology. Now, what members of the church and scholars have done for years and years is they've just said, okay, I'm, I'm swallowing it. I'm going to stick with it because to, you know, I don't have an answer otherwise. But I can guarantee you with some assurity that Ezra didn't live to be 134 and Nehemiah not to 121. Just don't think it happened. Um, now, whether the true decree was 536 or, or 457, the 457 date really is inconsistent with why God is specifically says, has Gabriel go to Daniel, what's it say? Swiftly. 
it's so, as if I'm coming to you to answer this question as to when all these things are going to happen, but, but just wait you know, a, you know, quite a few decades before it, it's going to happen. It just doesn't make sense. In other words, that, 40, that 49 years, that first seven years that equates to 49 years, it ain't going to start till you're gone and dead. It ain't going to start for another, you know, how many years is that? 80-something years later. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, <clears throat> so that doesn't answer your question, but it just, again, I, I don't know what that timeline is. I think I'm going to probably find out when I get to heaven. Uh, I don't think I'm going to have, I don't think I'm fully going to get the answer here. And nor do I think historians are going to go back and, on, on, and, you know, it's going to show up in Time magazine. The Persian chronology has been, it's been changed. It's never going to happen because people's PhDs and dissertations and everything all depend on it. So it, we're just never going to see that in our lifetime. Um, so all we can do is, to some extent, kind of swallow the accepted chronology to some extent, but I think we have to, we have to, I think, connect Daniel to this time period in which Jesus is there. And, it, and you can't get from Daniel chapter 9 to Matthew 24 unless those are years. That's, that's, where I, that's what I would say. And, um, and so, guys, I think that, I, I know class is almost over. When you look at this language of what's going to happen, <clears throat> uh, the, the regular burnt offering taken away from him, the place of a sanctuary overthrown. And who's going to do this? It's going to be someone that's referred to as the prince of the host. And I, I among me, most people that I've read, believe that to be Rome, to be Titus himself, a prince of the host. Um, and so, uh, it, again, it's an incredibly beautiful passage, and I'm, I'm so glad that this class has afforded us a chance to really, I think, hopefully connect these dots between what, I mean, all of these things really are transpiring during this interbiblical period. Much of what's going to happen that Daniel's prophesying is going to happen in the, in the interbiblical period. And of course, this is the one place where Daniel takes us past the interbiblical period to Jesus himself and to the ultimate sacrifice that's made. Uh, and uh, and it's, a, it's a beautiful piece of scripture. We're, we're just about out of time. Tell me, uh, does anybody have any thoughts or questions? I want to bring one point to your attention real quick, and I want you to look at this. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see here. And it says something about the transgression. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find that passage here real quickly. Um, let's see. It grew great, even the host of heaven, and some of the hosts, the stars threw it down. It became great, even as the prince of hosts, we talked about that, burnt offerings taken away from him, placed the sanctuary overthrown, host was given over. Um, <clears throat> oh, I want to, I'm looking here, just one second. Yes, that's it. Yes, that's where, that's, I'm in, yeah, that's, that's where I was going. What does it mean to finish the transgression? How, in what way would the transgression be complete? Um, and and who, whose transgression and in what way would it be fulfilled, completed? Um, who are we talking about? And in what way was it, was it finished, completed, made, made fully manifest? Jesus uses those very words on the cross, it's finished. Uh, and following up with that, it's to make an end of sin, to make an atonement for guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Yeah, I, I, think, you, I think you're right on. And, and so the... The, the true pinnacle and fulfillment of the transgression of the Jews would be the, the, the murder of, of the Son of God himself. It would be the denial of the Son of God. That's the peak. That's, that's the ultimate fulfillment of, trans, of that tr transgression. And, and, of course, we know that, of course, Jesus, you know, would, would, when he died on the cross, all that, the, the veil is torn, the Gentiles... Uh, now have opportunity for the kingdom. But I, I believe that, that and I, I think that the context bears that out, that the fulfillment of the transgression of the Jews was their denial and, and execution of Jesus himself. Any thoughts? Now, you, now you're experts on Daniel chapter 9. <laughs> you all, so if you... 
<laughs> if you all come up, I'll give you a certificate that says you're now an expert on Daniel chapter 9. Now, listen, I'm not, an, listen, I don't consider myself, I, I have, I approach this humbly, realizing that, I mean, it's, it's heavy, it's detailed, but all, I think as long as we take away from this class that Daniel is pointing to, to Jesus, and that Jesus was there, and Jesus looked back to Daniel. <laughs> Daniel says, look at Jesus, and Jesus says, look back at Daniel. Thank you so much for, your, for being here. We're, we're gonna move.